Um, that was a real ego boost. I don't, I don't know. I feel like I was really oversold here. Um, and it's a real honor to be here. Um, Phyllis is definitely one of my personal heroes on this campus. I have great personal and professional respect for the really important work that you do here. So I'm very honored to be invited. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to try and go rather quickly so that we can get through everything today because I have lots of things that I want to share with you and not a lot of time. So um, we've already gone over some of these things, so I'm going to skip them. Um, but just, just very very quickly, um, Oasis is responsible for things like Take Back the Night, Red Flag Campaign, Love Your Body Day, the Fem Sex Workshop, Sober Sex, um, and various presentations on campus such as this and some fun workshops like Ask the Sexpert. If you're interested in any of those, please contact me. And what I'm going to do is actually send around an email list sheet. No pressure at all, but if you're interested in receiving emails from us when, you, um, when we have events coming up, if you want to either just participate or volunteer, we're happy to um, add you to that and send those to you. You. I promise we don't barrage with emails. It's just a couple of semester, just so you know what's going on. And just know that as a student, you have access to 12 um, counseling sessions a year at the ETSU Counseling Center right down the hall. The red flag, red flag campaign is this week, um, and we are wrapping that up tomorrow. So we're going to be out at the pedestrian mall or probably the cave patio because it's going to be raining. Um, but the flags will still be out, and we um, really would appreciate you stopping by and learning how to be an active bystander when you see red flags for relationship and sexual violence. Um, in terms of learning information more um, in regards to the official ETSU and TBR sexual misconduct policies or resources or how to report a violation through the judicial system here on campus, you're going to want to go to the ETSU Violence Free webpage and there's all sorts of information on there that you can access. The education that I provide is for educational purposes, but if you need information on how to get there or you need some advocacy and support, I'm happy to direct you to the right people and help you through that. So let's talk about what sexual violence is. This includes any sexual act without consent. It is violence, not sexuality, not love, not passion. It's a human rights violation, and it includes rape, sexual assault, sexual harassment, stalking, fondling, and grabbing somebody sexually. Some important statistics, 90% uh, of sexually assaulted college women know their attacker, and it's either a classmate, classmate friend, ex-partner, or acquaintance. I think that this is important to recognize because culturally, I think we have more of an assumption that people who sexually assault others are strangers coming out of a bush with yielding a weapon in the dark and then retreat into the darkness, still a stranger, and that very clearly is a crime based on things like Law and Order SVU. But if nine out of 10 times in a college experience, the, the sexual assault is perpetrated by someone known to the victim, that becomes very confusing. That definition gets skewed. And so sometimes when a person experiences this, they know that something very wrong happened, but they don't even have a word for it. Um, so it's really important to recognize that most sexual assaults on college campuses are done by a friend. Um, and I should have said this at the beginning, just a trigger warning. Some of the things that we're talking about today can be triggering or upsetting to individuals, whether something has happened to you or you know someone who has experienced something so please do take advantage of our counseling services if you need them and we also have a 24 7 phone line called Bucks Press 2 where you just call our counseling center number and can talk to someone on the phone any time of day um, and feel free to leave at any time if it becomes uncomfortable or you just have to go there's no I will not be offended okay um, one in four university women will be a victim of attempted or completed rape and the current statistic for men is one in 16 during college and over the lifespan it's one in three women and one in six men um, most frequent locations of completed on-campus rapes are the victim's residence, as most often another residence or in a fraternity. So what is sexual assault specifically? It's intentional, committed by physical force, violence, intimidation, or threat, ignoring the objections of another person, causing another's intoxication or impairment, or taking advantage of another's incapacitation, helplessness, or other inability to consent. Just to be clear here, um, the causes of rape are rapists. That's it. Um, and <laughs> so just, I mean, if you're wondering, I just wanted to clear it up. It's just the whole pie is rapists. Um, and just, just to be clear about this, um, 
I'm going to go over the other ones in a sec. But um, I think it's important to um, bring up the statistic of 98% um, of sexual, relational, and gender violence that's perpetrated in our culture is perpetrated by those who identify as male. Um, and this in no way, shape, or form mean, means that 98% of men perpetrate this kind of violence. It's actually a very, very small percentage. Only 3% of the population are um, identify themselves as serial rapists through the way that questions are asked in um, studies. Um, but of that percentage, a really high rate of them identify as male. Um, and knowing that, the, those people, the people who perpetrate things like this, and oftentimes it is serial, serially done, there are also a small percentage of people who, through studies in interviews, have identified themselves as, as completing one rape, um, regretting it and not doing it again. Um, but again, so, so total, there's a pretty low percentage of people who actually perpetrate th these crimes. Um, and let's talk about these factors that play into rape. Um, slutty clothes, so no one is ever responsible for being being raped for what they wear. Alcohol, no one is ever responsible for being raped by how much they drink. Um, alcohol is the number one date rape drug, so it is often used by rapists to facilitate a rape. Um, so it is a tool that a rapist might use, but it, the alcohol is not responsible. It is still the person who is assaulting another person. Um, in terms of minorities, 60% of um, sexual assaults are um, perpetrated by Caucasians, so the major majority are Caucasian. And in terms of weather, the only thing that I could think up was that Baby It's Cold Outside song, which is absolutely an example of sexual assault. So in case you're wondering, I actually have a picture on my door that says it has two cute little penguins with um, scarves, and it says, Baby, it's cold outside, but I respect your choice to leave anyway. Um, just, to, just to address that Christmas song that's super creepy. Um, he was, I mean, when you, if you listen to the words, she's like, what's in this drink? So there's potentially more alcohol or a drug in the drink. She's coming up with all these reasons that she wants to leave, and it's hurting the person's pride. Those are examples of absolutely facilitating a sexual assault. In terms of television, I do think that media um, advertisements, TV, movies, music videos, all these things in our culture um, that we pay attention to often um, absolutely have an influence over um, making rape culture and gender violence culture acceptable. So I do think that media plays a huge role in perpetuating issues that are, are related to sexual assault, but still, the person who is committing the crime is the one who is responsible. So let's talk about how you can engage in a healthy, safe sexual encounter. Um, to me, what I usually tell students is there are two things that I regard um, in terms of thinking about what a health, safe sexual encounter looks like. And that is one, protection. Um, and, we t and when we have time, we talk about different methods of protection and, and what to know about that, because it's important to be educated talking about sex and sexual activity and relationships instead of um, make, feeding into this cultural idea that it's very taboo and guilt and shame um, involved. So these are the things that have to be established in order to know that consent is happening. Both partners are fully conscious and aware. What does that mean? Anybody? What needs to be happening to know that a person is fully conscious and aware? Or what can't be happening? Can't be, drunk. can't be drunk. Yeah. So you can learn from my colleague, Mina McVeigh, who's the alcohol and other drugs coordinator. You can learn how to count your drinks. So you can maintain what she calls the perfect buzz and still be sober. You cannot be drunk. What else? You can't be drugged. You can't be drugged, absolutely, or, or on any drugs. Because the problem with, with alcohol, you can measure it to know when you're above or below the legal BAC. But with other drugs, there's not a safe way to measure that. What else? Anything else? Asleep. You can't be asleep. And a lot of times students laugh at that, and I'm like, well, the sad reality is we have to have that as part of this conversation, because that absolutely happens. Both partners are equally free to act, choose, and change their minds. What does that mean? You can say no at any time. You can say no at any time, absolutely. What else? Anything else? Coerced. You what? Not being coerced. You can't be coerced, absolutely. And in terms of saying no at any time, that means during the encounter, you could be in the middle of doing something and say, you know, this isn't for me anymore. Um, I'd like to stop. Or you can maybe agree to something at one point and then later change your mind before it happens. And you absolutely have the right to do that. Anything else you can think of? You get to choose the kind of sexual acts that you're interested in being involved with, OK? There, we, in our culture, we tend to have this sort of a really binary idea of what sex is. It's either you absolutely do nothing 
And this is also something we call a ver virgin whore phenomenon when we think about the way that women um, are related to sexuality. Either you do nothing and you're a virgin or you're frigid, or you do every anything, anything at all that involves what we imagine sex to be in our culture, which technically we think of as specifically vaginal intercourse. And we sort of miss, and then you're, and then you're identified as a slut or a whore or some horrible name like that. And then we forget all of these other things in the middle, these wonderful things that you can do that are pleasurable and fun and OK. Um, and, and that's sort of how we think about it. So there are all sorts of things that you might want to consent to and other things that you might not want to consent to. And that needs to be made clear. Both partners clearly communicate their willingness and permission. What does that mean? What has to happen? Anybody? Some sort of affirmative, like yes. Yeah, yeah. So how do you how do you how do you say yeah? How do you make yes happen or an affirmation happen? Talk. You talk. You use your words. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. But is that usually what we do in our culture? Yeah. No. What do we do? What do we usually use to confirm or deny consent to something? Body language, absolutely, absolutely. So we're a culture that doesn't really talk about these things. We just do them. And we tend to look for nonverbal cues to know whether or not a person's OK with doing it. And so my argument is, if you're not ready to talk about it, like if you, if you can't say words like penis and vagina, or you know, there's a, there's a video that we won't have time for, but John Oliver did this great video recently called Sex Ed. And I strongly encourage you to watch it. It's 20 minutes. It's so funny. And the, they, they make this special video that says, if you still call it a hoo-ha, you are not ready to have sex. So just an example of how we do these things, but we are afraid to even use words to talk about them. And that is absolutely very important. Because if someone shakes their booty and winks, and you assume that means they want to have sex, which in our culture is technically vaginal intercourse, and they're thinking something completely different, like maybe I'm just interested in how you look and might be interested in getting to know you a little bit better, then we've had a mass miscommunication. And that absolutely can lead to sexual assault being perpetrated. Both partners are positive and sincere in their desires. This one's a tough one, so I'm just going to tell you. Um, this is like if someone says they love you or they want to be your partner in order to get sexual activity from you, that is absolutely not getting consent. Um, it's never assumed, implied, coerced, or convinced. So a lot of times people don't realize that if they say no and someone makes them feel guilty or continues to pressure them to say yes and then they do say yes, they don't realize that that actually counts as sexual assault. So if a person says no and then eventually they say yes because they are pushed and bothered and prodded, they are absolutely being assaulted. Consent is not the absence of the word no. So silence does not mean yes. So there was you know, a previous campaign um, that was titled No Means No, and now there's a lot more focus on yes means yes, again, supporting the idea that you need to be getting clear communication that yes, the person wants to do something, not silence. Um, and consent is the responsibility of the initiator. When I ask students this, a lot of times they say, it's the guy, it's the girl, it's the parents. And that gets a little weird when they say that, but um, <laughs> it's both. But it's actually the initiator. So, um, so an example of that might be that a person's pants don't just magically come off. You know, Someone does something to get them on the floor. Or one activity doesn't just move into the other without someone initiating that move. Um, and so the person who is initiating that sexual act, the person who is initiating something, is the one who is responsible for making sure verbally that the other person is OK with what they're doing. What I also like to say to people is, because I get a lot of questions about the legalistic details, like is someone going to accuse me of rape the next day You know, if I didn't realize that they were drunk, or um, lots of questions like that. And, and my response to that is, I think it's important to, to take a look at yourself in the mirror and think if when you are approaching a sexual encounter, the first thing that comes to mind is how can I do this without going to jail, then we need to kind of rethink our behavior. And we need to rethink how we're engaging sexually with another person. Let's think more along the lines of who am I as a human and who is this other person as another human, OK? If the person is just lying there and they haven't specifically said no, and my excuse is but they didn't say no, 
well, did you think that maybe it would be more fun or respectful to check in with the person and make sure they're enjoying themselves and that you're not just thinking about what you want out of a sexual experience? Did that ever occur to you? How are you interacting with that person? Are you treating them with respect? Are you thinking about their needs? Are you making sure that they are enjoying themselves as much as you are? Um, so, so maybe starting to look at it also through a lens of just being a respectful, good person to another person instead of legally, am I going to get in trouble if I do this or if I don't? do this. So here are some examples. It seems so obvious when we talk about these things outside of the purview of sexual activity. And when you think about consenting to behavior or consenting to doing something, um, it seems really silly when it's in terms of things like, say, a movie. So this guy is saying, want to watch Pulp Fiction to his friend? Sure. A half hour later, mm, not really liking this. Let's do something else. No, you said you'd watch the movie, so you're staying until it's done. So again, the idea of sort of acting, choosing, changing your mind, he's, you know, he's making a choice here. It's been about a half hour, I'm good, nope, gotta stay. Seems ridiculous with a movie, why is that so ridiculous with sex? Thanks for letting me borrow your car. No problem. What are you doing the next week? Borrowing your car, you said I could. You can't take my car whenever you want it. That's bull, you said I could have it once, so I should be able to have it all the time. Okay, so it's ridiculous to assume that someone can just have whatever they want from you when it's an object, and it certainly should be even more ridiculous when it's your body. This is an example of taking advantage of someone while they were sleeping. And unconscious. Um, this is the idea of um, someone inviting someone over or welcoming someone into their um, apartment or home and feeling like they are obligated to be sexually active with them because somehow inviting them into that space means inviting them into their personal sexual space. Um, and I encounter this a lot with um, clients who have experienced sexual um, violence. Um, and a, I would say a majority, if not every single client that I've had who has experienced sexual assault holds at least when they start counseling, hold some form of guilt or personal responsibility for the assault because they invited the person up or because they agreed to go somewhere with the person. Um, so this is definitely a cultural pressure and um, it definitely gets integrated into a person's concept of whether or not they were sexually assaulted and who is responsible. Um, and this is sort of the idea of wearing what, what clothes you're wearing, being you know asking for something just based on how you look. I just want to check the time and see. Okay. Um, so in terms of the life of a college student, I'm not saying that in any way that every college student who comes to college is getting involved with partying and using alcohol and drugs, but it absolutely happens. And for some students, it's the first time they're away from home, away from their families and other rules that they've had. Um, for people who might identify as LGBTQQ, it might be the first time that they have a chance to come out more comfortably. I'm not necessarily saying that that's the case, but it might be. Um, there's more social networking that might be different than it was in high school. There's trust and assumptions you might be making that you're all here for the same reasons and have the same goals and intentions. You might have expectations and desires to be liked, to be accepted socially, to be coupled. Um, and you know, developmentally, when you think about the transition from high school to college, um, the, the way that things work socially in high school can be very different than college. So you might have this expectation that you have to behave a certain way or do certain things when you first get here in order to be popular, um, when in fact, I think for a lot of students, the college experience is very different once they've gotten used to it and learned that. Um, um, you're learning, sometimes you're learning independence for the first time. And, and so what happens to a lot of students, you know, for the, the beginning of the year, especially when they're freshmen, if they are involved in something like drinking or, or trying new substances or going to parties, what sometimes happens? Anybody? Any ideas? Sort of like when you're never, you're, you're kind of repressed, you're never allowed to do certain things, and then suddenly you have this open floodgate of nobody, you know, no curfew, no parents around. What sometimes happens? You do everything. You do everything. Wow, college, you know, and you go a little crazy. And you know, the hope is that, you know, once you've learned to figure out how to count your drinks, not get so drunk that you throw up all over the place, you, you hope that the worst case scenario for a person is that they learn from their mistakes, say, whoops, not going to do that again, and then the next time they make a better choice, right? But 
this is why the first day of school for freshmen through Thanksgiving break is the most dangerous time in terms of um, sexual assaults, and it's actually been termed the red zone, because that is absolutely taken advantage of. Because before a person learns from their mistakes and wises up, there are people who take advantage of that. And in terms of sexual experimentation, it's completely developmentally appropriate to be doing that during college, but again, that can be taken advantage of as well. And then also our cultural assumption that somehow if someone is sexually active, especially women are sexually active, that somehow they deserve what happens to them. Um, I think it's important to talk about what psychological characteristics of rape trauma look like because um, we tend to minimize and downplay what the experience of a rape is for a victim. Um, and again, this, this ties into all that victim blaming attitude that we tend to have. Um, because uh, as a culture, we tend to view it more as when someone reports a rape, I feel like it's a, a lot of times I hear these reactions that are somewhere along the lines of something like, you know, you just had a regretful sexual encounter, just move on, it's no big deal, get over it, it's, no, you know, it's, it's, it's not a thing. Whereas for the victim of this violent crime, it actually is absolutely a huge deal and can affect a person for years. It can affect them for the rest of their lives in the way that they um, treat a sexual encounter or feel about a sexual encounter, even with someone who's safe. Um, and it usually takes quite a bit of counseling and support to get through that. Um, I think that counseling is very, very helpful in addressing it, but um, to pass it off like it's, it's just a regretful sexual encounter, and oftentimes then, then accusing people of false reporting because they regretted it and they don't want to deal with that, so they blame someone else. That also, I think, is a, is a big victim-blaming cultural myth, that there are a lot of people out there crying rape the morning after regretting doing something, um, when in fact, the statistic is 2 to 8% of reports are false, which is the exact same as any other crime. So 92 to 98% of the time, it's true. So some of the symptoms involved are things like PTSD or acute trauma, grief, anxiety, depression, shame, um, some memory loss. A lot of times when a person is traumatized, they might forget pieces of what happened. Um, this also adds to our doubt with our victim blaming attitudes um, about whether or not a person is telling the truth or the whole truth because they come out with different information later on um, when in fact that's um, absolutely a um, common symptom of trauma. Or the person had been drinking so they don't remember everything that happened. Maybe they were blacked out for part of it. Um, other examples are loss of control, shock and numbness. Um, and I think it's important for us to recognize that um, we, I think we make judgments about victims based on what we expect them to be. Um, and again, this is part of this um, victim blaming piece where we are scrutinizing and questioning and um, always looking at the person who's reported the crime versus um, the person who they're accusing. Um, so oftentimes we're maybe thinking, why is this person acting this way? Because we have this image in our head of what the perfect victim should look like. You know, so we might imagine someone who's crying all the time, who gets really depressed, or is showing the emotions of, um, that match the situation. Whereas if you aren't educated about trauma responses, you might not know that a very common reaction to trauma is shock and numbness. So the person might not be showing any emotion at all. And then in addition to that, they might not remember everything that happened, or they might remember that later. Um, so I think it's important for us to be educated about those pieces as well, and to think about how we're questioning who and why. Um, because as a culture, I think we, can, we tend to go to the victim first, and we don't do that for other crimes. So if my house was broken into, and God forbid I was stabbed, say, okay? Um, is someone going to say, well, it was, you, you kind of asked for that because you left your door open, right? And you should have been wearing body armor, and you weren't, so you were kind of asking to be stabbed. Th that conversation would never happen. So why is it so different when it comes to violence like sexual relationship and gender violence? Um, Victims are often reluctant to report a sexual assault for m multiple reasons, um, some of which are retaliation, Shame, guilt, embarrassment, fear that they won't be believed, and lack of support. Um, there's, I think there's you know, shame and embarrassment in having to sexual storytell about um, experiences, especially with people you don't really know. Um, so that's absolutely understandable. Um, when I work with victims, I encourage them to report if they want to um, and let them know that that's an option. And I absolutely support them if they want the, to, but I don't make them do anything that they 
don't want to do because the last thing that you want to do for someone who has been victimized in some way is to re-victimize them or take away more of their power and control by telling them what they have to do. Um, but I think that this university is doing a really good job moving forward and figuring out ways to be transparent and open with students about avenues for um, reporting and providing appropriate support, including referring them to us at the Counseling Center. Um, there can be additional layers of complications um, and dissuasion for reporting if you're talking about if a victim is male. Um, and I think that a lot of that has to do with um, the, our cultural assumptions about what it means to be a real man and so what it means for a male victim or a victim who identifies as male. Um, I also think that there are complications if you identify as anywhere on the LGBTQ spectrum um, because there is potential for out, having to out yourself. Maybe you ha you're not out to everybody and in order to report it you have to sexual story tell about something that you're not comfortable with. Um, so, so there are these additional layers of complication for different populations, absolutely. Um, I want to talk about the difference between risk reduction and prevention. I think that there is some confusion about or disagreements about what um, what view you're taking if you are in support of things like risk reduction or risk reduction techniques like using a buddy system or or talking to your friends about where you're going creating a safety plan or a plan with your friends, like if someone leaves the group or goes off with somebody else, what is the plan in place for follow-up? Drinking responsibly, knowing how to count your drinks, defining your personal standards and sticking to them, thinking ahead of time, of time about what you're comfortable with in terms of engaging with someone relationally or sexually and sticking to those, or if you change your mind, that's okay, but knowing that you're making that decision for yourself. Um, no, being educated about what constitutes sexual assault, rape, and consent. Um, and knowing campus resources like the Counseling Center, like public safety, like our Bucks Press 2 line. Um, and asking for help. And if you want that help to be confidential and you don't want to report it to the police or student affairs, you absolutely can come to the Counseling Center and do that or call the Bucks Press 2 line. Um, and I think that some argue that these techniques are or encouraging people, especially women, to engage in these techniques is adding to victim blaming. Um, and I, I, I want to argue against that. I want to argue it um, as a both and situation. I think that it's, it's important to make a distinction with that these are risk reduction techniques, not prevention techniques, because it is, it is not a person's responsibility to protect, prevent their own assault. It is not my responsibility if somebody assaults me because I didn't drink responsibly or because I didn't talk to my friends. That's not, that's not on me, that's on the person who perpetrated the assault. But I also think that it's important to be educated about these things because it can help you in these situations or to, uh, to help avoid some of these situations. And I have examples from clients in which this has absolutely happened. I had a client recently who told me that she wasn't as educated about the components of consent earlier and she wasn't educated about um, how to stick to her own sexual standards and desires. And so she experienced sexual assault didn't realize that that's what it was and didn't realize what her options were. And now that she is educated about those things and now that she does know what her rights are and how to um, communicate what she's okay with and what she's not okay with, she has avoided situations in which she would have been assaulted. It is absolutely still the person's responsibility who was pushing her, absolutely. It is not her responsibility. But those, those um, risk reduction techniques did help. So in terms of prevention, um, think when, when we're talking about personally being in the situation, um, you want to regard your own actions and behaviors. You want to learn to recognize sexism when you see it or hear it. Talk about sex with others, with the other person who you are sexually engaged with. And realize that sexual violence is primarily a men's issue. Now, I'm not saying that men are the only ones who are responsible for preventing sexual assault. That's absolutely not true. But because so much of the violent, this type of violence in our culture is perpetrated by people who identify as male, I think it's really effective and powerful for men to talk to other men. I feel like there are definitely some occasions in which I've talked to groups of men, and it's been effective. It's been really good. But I can imagine how much better it would be if there was a man in a more peer related leadership role in that room and how they might have responded more honestly, more differently. Um, I think that there's a lot to be said for that. For the sake of time, I don't know if we're going to have time to watch this video. So we might, we might come back to this. 
Um, so if you are in a situation in which someone comes to you and reports that they have recently been sexually assaulted, these are some ideas of what you can say. Okay, things like, do you need help? Are you okay? This isn't your fault. It's okay, is it okay for me to give you some information? What do you need? Do you want me to call someone for you? Who are your social supports? And notice that none of these options involve judging, blaming, or forcing the person to do anything that they don't wanna do. So you're letting them control, you're letting them make the decisions for themselves, and you're just letting them know that you're facilitating support for them. Um, this is another very effective mode of prevention. It's actually one of the things that the, sec the uh, White House Sexual Assault Task Force has identified as one of the most effective um, college um, interventions. Um, does, can anyone tell me what the bystander effect is? Does anybody know? Well, it's like if you're with a group of people and um, you see that nobody else is reacting to something that you think is wrong, then you're less likely to react to it because nobody else is. Absolutely. So yeah, it's a sociological concept that they've done lots of studies on that the more people who are present for some sort of crime being committed, the less likely it is that any one person will take responsibility to do anything because this is, there's this inherent assumption that someone else is going to call the police, someone else is going to step in. Um, and so the idea of bystander intervention is the opposite of that. It's taking personal responsibility as a bystander and looking at yourself as not necessarily a potential victim, not necessarily a potential perpetrator, but as a bystander to to these crimes that do happen, or a bystander to things that happen that feed into ideas like rape culture and gender violence culture. Um, so you want to say something or do something if you see and hear something that you know is not OK. And this is a continuum. Um, this can I'm not expecting you ever, of course, to be involved with seeing um, a relationship violence um, situation actually happening in that moment. I don't expect you to be seeing a sexual encounter happen that becomes sexual assault. But what you might do is you might hear someone make a rape joke, or you might hear someone say something really degrading and inappropriate about somebody. And you have a choice point there. You can say nothing. So even if you don't support it and you don't laugh, or you don't say that's really funny or that's OK, um, you're not doing anything. And so in that moment, the person who said those things might not have that opportunity to hear from someone that it's not OK. Um, so what I'm encouraging you to do is, on this continuum of hearing these things, to say something or do something when you hear or see them. Try to think, if this were my sister, if this were my brother, if this were my best friend or my partner or a parent, what would I want for them? So imagine if the person is saying a degrading comment about them, imagine if that was they were saying that about your significant other or about a family member. How would you want someone else to respond if they were in your shoes? That's your responsibility in that moment because that person is someone's family member. That person is someone's partner, potentially. And recognize victim blaming attitudes. Start paying attention to the way people talk about things and the way that you think about things. This is the um, a campaign we have going on on campus right now called Buccaneer Bystander Intervention. And this gives you all sorts of different techniques, uh, ideas that you can use to intervene. Um, and we actually have copies of these at the Red Flag Campaign. Um, so you can absolutely come and pick up one from us tomorrow. Or you can always email me, um, and I can send you a digital copy. OK, and so I think that it's important to um, recognize the distinction. Jackson Katz, um, I, there was a video of him, but I don't think we're going to have time. Um, but he came here in January and talked a little bit about the idea of the bystander approach, that um, he sort of coined that term in the 90s. And um, it's been used by a lot of bystander intervention um, programs to kind of create um, the ideas of the programs. And what he says is the bystander approach, the short-term goal of it, is to normalize and prevent Oh, sorry. Where is my little? Oh, here we go. To prevent assaults through intervention to, through an intervention skill set. So, sort of like those buccaneer bystander ideas, there is a skill set you can learn so that you know how to intervene in those moments. But the long-term approach is, and I quote, to change the underlying belief system and social norms that tolerate or encourage sexist and abusive behaviors. So it doesn't really help that much to learn a skill set if you don't genuinely believe that there are these beliefs and social norms that create these 
problems in the first place. So the only real use of those skill sets are to recognize that this is a cultural issue and that each time we're using these skill sets, we're actually trying to change the culture. We're trying to create a culture that is sex positive and that is a consent culture versus a rape culture and a gender violence supporting culture. So I like, I like the way that this is termed as well. Um, John Damianos is one of the sexual assault prevention activists at Dartmouth College, and he's specifically referring to a men's um, leadership program. Um, and so he's he, ca he calls them microaggressions, and I really like the idea of that. So he says that it means that on campus, people will set the president that sexual assault is not OK. And beyond that, that all of the microaggressions along the spectrum of harm that lead to rape culture are also not OK. And those can range from a rape joke, suggesting that someone was asking for it based on what they were wearing to catcalling somebody. So these are those sort of those, that spectrum of harm I was talking about um, in which you aren't necessarily going to stop a sexual assault from happening um, in that moment, but there are absolutely all of these little microaggressions on the way that lead to supporting someone's belief that what they're doing is completely socially acceptable. Um, and I think that it is so powerful when peers reject uh, something. So, so if we as peers are making rape jokes and are normalizing catcalling people and judging people on, based on what they're wearing, then what we are basically communicating to these really small percentage of serial perpetrators is that your behavior is totally socially acceptable, right? But if we start to say the opposite and that catches on and it suddenly becomes the group think instead of just one individual stepping up, if you can recruit other people into buying into this and believing this message, then suddenly the peer group and the culture itself begins to reject the behavior of this person. And I think that that is the most powerful thing. Me coming up here and telling you that it's wrong and giving you all these statistics, um, if someone who perpetrates these kind of things serially, um, they're probably not gonna hear me in that moment. But what they might hear is if their entire peer group rejects them based on those behaviors. So I think that the bystander approach is extremely important and can be potentially the most effective thing to addressing things like sexual violence and relationship violence. All right, I have time for one video. I'm trying to decide which one is the best one to do. Um, I think the consent, this consent T one is really fun, but I think that there's one that's more important to show you. I don't know if you're familiar with Tony Porter, but he um, uh, has a, a uh, program called A Call to Men. So it's a men's leadership program in addressing um, things like gender and sexual violence. Um, and I just want to play a clip from that. It's not loud enough. Do you know? Do you know here, let me try the volume on you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Let's try that. Okay. I, when I was about 12 years, years old, I grew up in tenement buildings, you know, in the inner city. At this time, I was living in the Bronx. And the building next to where I lived, there was a guy named John Connor. He's about 16 years old. We were all about 12 years old, a younger guy. And he was hanging out with all us younger guys. And this guy, he was up to a lot of no good. He was the kind of kid my parents left to one. Let the 16-year-old boy go and meet 12 year old boys. And he did spend a lot of time up to no good. He was a troubled kid. You know, his mother had died from a heroin overdose. He was being raised by his uh, grandmother. His father was on the set. His grandmother had two jobs. He was home alone a lot. But I gotta tell you, we young guys, we looked up to this dude, man. He was cool. He was fine. That's what his sister said. He was fine, right? He was having sex. You know, we all looked up to him. So one day I'm out in front of the house doing something, just playing around, doing something, I don't know what. He looks out his window, he calls me upstairs and said, hey, Anthony, they call me Anthony going up to the kid. Hey, Anthony, come on upstairs. Johnny called, you go. So I run right upstairs. As he opens the door, he says to me, do you want something? Now I immediately knew what he meant. Because for me growing up at that time and our relationship with this man box, do you want something meant one of two things, sex or drugs. And we weren't doing drugs. Now, my box, my card, my man box card was immediately in jeopardy. 
Two things. One, I never had sex. We don't talk about that as men. We only tell your dearest, closest friends who want secrets for life the first time you had sex. But everybody else, we go around like we've been having sex since we were two. They ain't no first time. <laughs> The other thing I couldn't tell them is that I didn't want any. You know, that's even worse. We're supposed to always be on the prowl. Women are objects, especially sexual objects. But anyway, I couldn't tell them any of that. So like my mother would say, make a long story short, I just simply said to Johnny, yes. He told me, go in his room. I go in his room, on his bed, there's a girl from the neighborhood named Sheila. She's 16 years old. She's new. She's what I know today to be mentally ill, higher functioning at times than others. We had the whole choice works, you know, inappropriate name for her. Anyway, Johnny had just gotten through having sex with her. Well, he actually raped her, but he would say he had sex with her because while Sheila never said no, she also never said yes. So he was offering me the opportunity to do the same. So when I go in the room, I close the door. Folks, I'm petrified. I stand with my back to the door so Johnny can't bust in the room and see that I'm not doing anything. And I stand there long enough that I could have actually done something. So now I'm no longer trying to figure out what I'm going to do. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to get out of this room. So in my 12 years of wisdom, I zip my pants down. I walk out into the living room. And if you know what to me, while I was in the room with Sheila, Johnny was back at the window calling the guys up. So now it's a living room full of guys. Like, you know, like the waiting room in the doctor's office. And they asked me how I was it was. And I say to them, it was good. And I zip my pants up in front of them. And I head for the door. Now I say this all with remorse, and I was feeling a tremendous amount of remorse at that time, but I was conflicting. So while I was feeling remorse, I was excited because I didn't get caught, but I knew I felt bad about what was happening. This fear of getting outside the man box totally enveloped me. Enveloped me. It was way more important to me about me and my man box card than about Sheila and what was happening to her. See, collectively, we as men are taught to have less value in women, to view them as property in the objects of men. We see that as an equation that equals violence against women. We as men, good men, the large majority of men, we operate on the foundation of this, this whole collective socialization. We kind of see ourselves separate, but we're very much a part of it. You see, we have to come to understand that less value, property, and objectification is the foundation, and violence can't happen without it. So we're very much a part of the solution as well as the problem. The Center for Disease Control says that men's violence against women is at epidemic proportion. It's the number one health concern for women in this country and abroad. So quickly, I'd like to just say, you know, this is my love of my life, my daughter Jay. The world I envision for her. How do I want men to be acting and behaving? I need you on board. I need you with me. I need you work with me and me working with you on how we raise our sons and teach them to be men. That it's okay to not be dominated. That it's okay to have feelings and emotions. That it's okay to promote equality. That it's okay to have women who are just friends and that's it. That it's okay to be whole. That my liberation as a man is tied to your liberation as a woman. I remember asking a nine-year-old boy, I asked a nine-year-old boy, what would life be like for you if you didn't have to hear this man box? He said to me, I would be free. Thank you, folks. All right, I just thought that was a good clip to just show um, the complication of how gender dynamics and expectations for genders in our culture um, play out in terms of this kind of violence. Um, and of course, this um, is very much gender binary that he's talking about. So this leaves out people who identify as gender fluid um, or gender nonconforming. Um, but I think that um, it's, a, it's a common issue in our culture. Um, that is all the time that I have. And I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. Um, so thank you so much for your attention. And any questions that you have, please feel free to ask me at this time. <laughs> yes, Harriet. Earlier, you said that three percent of the population of man sexually assaulted, right? Serially, serially perpetrate sexual assault or rape. Yes. Well, we got a number. Are we talking population of the United States? 
Oh, I don't know. That's a good question. I think that it's population of the United States. Um, you don't have a number of what 3% name? No. That's 3 million. No. There would be a lot of people if you divided it by 50 states. Yes. I'm just not that, I'm just curious on that point. Yep. Means there's a lot of people out there walking around that could be doing this. Not to say that they're all men. Wow. All of them probably are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but still, it's scary. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a lot of people. Yeah. Yes. The, the state of Tennessee did a study, the Economic Commission on Women did a study on the cost of violence against women in the state of Tennessee, mm -hmm. and they said that it was their study, this was 2012, 2013, showed that it cost the state around $800 million. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if anybody has done a study on the cost on colleges, camp, college campuses for sexual That's a really violence. good question. I'd be very curious. In relationship violence. That's the thing. I mean, sometimes that's the way that I frame it, is if you're not emotionally invested in this issue, you might be fiscally because it costs a heck of a lot. Violence against women, sexual violence, relationship violence, super expensive. Absolutely. I mean, it's certainly a retention matter on our campus. Retention yes. and graduate, and we were talking a lot about we were talking a lot about graduation here, and so that is, the, these factors are are interwoven. Absolutely, absolutely. So if your if your primary focus on this campus is retention and is student success, you can't be academically successful if you're experiencing acute trauma. You just can't, and you shouldn't be expected to. That's a first order concern, and it gets in the way. That's absolutely true. Yes. Um, most of the time when we think about sexual violence, we think about um, the physical and emotional aspects of it, but uh, there's also the financial part of it. And I mean, it's some of what you're talking about is like um, encounters with people who you, you might not be in a relationship with, but in a relationship there could be that financial abuse that keeps um, partners together. Mm -hmm. Um, I was curious if you had any sense of how much of an effect that has on a college campus or if that is more of a concern for um, students like after they graduate. Sure. Sure. Yeah, um, I don't. I mean, I don't have any statistics on that in terms of college um, relationships versus relationships after or outside of college. Um, but I do know in terms of um, in terms of more information on relationship violence and the dy dynamics of that and how that plays out um, in relationships over time. The power and control wheel, I think, is a really good visual to show all the emotional and psychological pieces that that add up to a. Con controlling and powerful relationship, um, and it absolutely counts as relationship violence. Whereas in our culture, I think a lot of us think of that kind of violence as specifically physical or sexual. Um, and we have a ton of information on that at the Red Flag Campaign, because the Red Flag Campaign was originally created specifically for dating violence on college campuses. Um, but I, I think that it is definitely sometimes a factor for college students as well, um, especially if the person is in financial straits and they're you know, with someone who can help prevent um, provide some financial stability or some support um, and then they can use that to their advantage so that the person comes dependent on them or something like um, they sign a lease together on an apartment and then the person is stuck in that lease for the entire year legally um, so there are things like that or they share a pet or something like that um, absolutely comes up with college students and even with and even if you think of it in terms of owing someone something in just a sexual encounter or a more casual relationship in college, um, you might have examples of so I have actually have uh, buttons that I made um, that have different pictures that say this is not consent and one has a drink on it and one has a person in a skirt on it and one of them has movie tickets and some popcorn around it because again like there's this idea that there's some sort of obligation that because someone spends money on you or takes you out to dinner or does something for you that you owe them something sexually and that's absolutely never true um, but that's absolutely a pressure that is communicated yes my mind wraps around some other issues with like social media and like, I mean with more and more apps coming out of like the fun and, they're just so funny how many apps there are now like okay keep it tinder and for all kinds of folks that are coming out um, there's more and more 
Um, and none of these explicitly say from the beginning that these were meet-up sex things, but none of them say that they're not. And so it's like this, everybody has these social media things that we're using more and more, and it's something, again, nobody really talks about. So, you know, keeping up with current technology, I wonder how conversations around things like that would continue. That's uh, that's a really good point, and because I'm so technologically unsavvy, I need to do my own research right. and do a lot more around that because I'm just so, so out of the loop. But I have, I mean, we've we, we sat down in the counseling center one day and accessed Yik Yak, and we're just appalled. Just app I mean, some of it was hilarious, and some of it was just absolutely appalling. I mean, some of the things that people were saying and indicating and talking about each other, um, really inappropriate, sexually violent, offensive. Um, and I, th I think that the anonymity that social media allows people, and the internet just generally allows people to have, um, creates more of a violent response or, or comfort with having more violent responses. Um, and it's sort of like that concept that very much applies to sexual violence and very much applies to violence just generally in the world is the idea of dehumanizing someone or making them more anonymous or less of a whole person and then being able to more easily enact violence on them. So that, that happens when you objectify somebody, they become less human or they become pieces of a human but not a whole and it's easier to be violent toward them and I think sort of in the same way it's like you you lose the humanity in a way because you can't you're not facing a person or you can be nobody um, when you say these things and I think that it um, encourages I think one of the things that I've realized amongst female friends and my partner has been open so she's been a tender um, is that you know what, what we're talking about like guys buying new drinks and then you all they feel like they deserve something. They get that immediately off of things like social media. Like there's not even the buying you a drink thing. It's like they sent you a message, <laughs> and so then they feel like that you deserve something. Right. So like so right. So it's beyond just like dinner and a drink. It's, it's like a message, hey, exactly. right? And having some sort of expectation. So like, how do you even talk about that? Like you know, like it's, that's it a, even further than buying you something. In Object. That is a really good point. That's a really right, right. So beyond even saying I'm inviting you to my space, it's like I'm just sending you a message, which takes two seconds, right. no effort, and then right. there's this expectation that somehow you are owing the person something, because because and this is a good example of the consent piece. You know, acting, choosing, and changing your minds. Just because you've consented one time doesn't mean that every time they text you, you owe them anything. That's absolutely true. I have to say, building on what Ben just said, I serve on the Sexual Assault Task Committee for the Del City Police Department. And an entire conversation was held between the police detective who's female and an assistant district attorney who's female on technology, beginning in latter elementary years, hiding apps behind apps, parents need to be educated, um, texting pictures. The detective was called at one point to nine year olds. Mom calls and says, what are you going to do? He texted his penis to her. And the detective says, let me see her phone. She had texted a picture of her at the time. The detective says, I can ask them both. They have both sent it to me. She's saying that we need it before you even have this call to penis. We need this education. We need this information. Absolutely. What are, what are my children looking at? What are my grandchildren looking at? Teachers need to recognize that they need to be educated. Absolutely. And just to give Ruth a little more credit, I, I mean, you run the task force. You don't just sit on it. So <laughs> she leads it. I just wanted to um, let everyone know that it's 1 o'clock, so um, you're, you're welcome to stay, and we can talk a little bit more. But if you have to go, feel free, because um, it is that time. So. Any other questions? I have yes. just a question about this campus um, in that it, it, we seem to have more reported sexual assaults that we've seen in, in recent years. And um, I know that I saw the video with Dr. Nolan where you said oh, yeah. increased reporting rating is actually good. But I, you know, um, I am a little, I have some questions about what what is the phenomenon happening on our campus? Is, is that a result of better education about what assault is? And um, what I mean, do you have any insight about what's sure. actually happening here?
Um, I, I don't have necessarily an accurate answer. My dream is that it's because the, my, my dream about it, and I'm just going to say this because I just want it to be this way, is just because they know more and we've been more open and transparent and, and um, there's been more attention drawn to it, more people are talking about it, asking questions, reaching out for the resources that we've been providing all this time. Um, but I also think that um, a piece of it is just the national attention that this issue is getting. So I think that my guess is that for people who are reporting Reporting, there is probably a combination of factors, and they might include things like hearing that someone else on campus reported and there, you know, there, there was some result or there was some response to it, hearing people talking about it and feeling like it's being a little more normalized for them to report it themselves. Um, and then maybe in addition to that, seeing it on the news pretty consistently, reading it in the paper, hearing about it on social media. Um, my hope is that the combined factors of that are making people feel more comfortable because we are, this is a conversation that more people are having than just advocates who are passionate about the issue. Yes. Well, kind of going on that, do you think that um, the way our campus may be um, reacting to that may actually, I know there are more, but cause different people to not report, because I know um, just in different classes I've had where we've talked about it, there have been some really negative reactions to the blatant um, victims, and I would think that that would kind of have an effect on other people not wanting to report. Absolutely. You mean there are negative reactions to to the victims reporting, like making yeah. victim blaming right. assumptions? Absolutely. I mean, this is still a huge issue: is people's reaction to people coming forward and reporting. And so that's why I mentioned that is um, there. There are absolutely a lot of again, it's us asking questions about well, why didn't they report this earlier? Why aren't more people reporting if this is actually happening? Well, there. First of all, why are we asking that question? Why is that always the first question that we ask? And the answer is there are lots of reasons for a person to not want to report. There is still an absolutely majority of cultural response that is negative and victim blaming and judgmental and shaming. Um, and until we, I think that until we normalize sexuality and talking about sexuality and being involved in sexual activity being okay and acceptable and developmentally appropriate, that's very hard because there's so much guilt and shame and judgment and um, ostracization, especially of women, um, when it comes to sexuality, the idea of sex and sexuality. Um, so, so my argument for that is that there needs to be sex education in schools way earlier than there is, and it needs to be actual sex education, not abstinence only or fear tactic education. And that's why I encourage you to watch the John Oliver video. Um, because there, and there is a lot of research now that's coming out talking about how different countries like Nor Norway and um, Sweden and all sorts of countries in Europe that are teaching kindergartners. I mean, they start sex ed in kindergarten, and it continues through um, because even kindergartners are starting to be curious about their body parts. And if you tell, if you like swipe a person's hand away as a child from their body part and say that's dirty or don't even give it a name, um, that leaves them with these, you know, feelings of shame and guilt and bad around those things, even as early as five years old. Um, and then it just continues and gets worse. Yes. That's okay. Kind of like, she was saying, but she's saying, you know, the reaction of police officers in situations where they're both minors is, why can I have some both? Do you think that that could be a really negative effect on these children? Um, so that could have a positive effect? I mean, it absolutely could by just saying, like, well, this person is just as much responsible. That sort of goes back to the idea that um, a lot of times, Jackson Katz talks a lot about this, about how we use language um, when we, t um, you know, I, I think that the idea of, you know, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me is not true at all. I think that the language that we use and the words that we use are, um, can be very hurtful and can determine a lot of ways that we have cultural responses or make assumptions about things. And that includes by um, not being very clear clear about who we're holding responsible for perpetrating vi sexual violence or what we're holding responsible for that instead of just saying well it's convoluted because there were two it was really two people it takes two to tango you hear that a lot when it comes to like when and even the way that you hear it um, portrayed in newspaper articles and in the media it's like a you know a situation gone wrong or somehow there's like this mysterious thing that happened but no one specific person is really being held accountable it just sort of happened to a person even just that passive language not being very clear like violence was perpetrated against a person by a person and this is who the perpetrator was uh, but we don't do that we kind of pull pull that out of 
uh, the language that we use or treat it like, well, this person sent a picture back. It's like, well, she was a nine-year-old, so <gasps> how is this not an issue? Um, yeah, absolutely. Our local school systems do, especially the city schools, and I'm not even gonna go to the nine-year-olds. Middle and high school, they don't, they don't like us talking about anything but abstinence. Well, I don't know if there's anybody in here that's gonna enter the, the school system and be teachers, but if you can go in on that level and start being an advocate for teaching sex education at an earlier age, that's probably going to help our society a lot. Absolutely, it's really, no, and it's really complicated because what happens is when people become open advocates, they get fired. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, it's a state issue. So, I mean, right. It's the same reason why, well, that's why Scott County, 39%, your, your teen pregnancy rate is at 39%. That's obscene. Mm -hmm. But what do they teach in the schools? Abstinence only if they teach anything. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. And the fact that you have to go jump through all these hoops to see all these statistics about it because no one wants to talk about it is equally as part of the problem. <laughs> and so, I mean, yeah. what, you know, until someone marches up the steps of the legislature in Nashville and people start getting loud about it, nothing's gonna happen. And that's that's how the state is. That's absolutely well, true. And there's and even even though there's tons of research to back up the the direct correlation between lack of sex education and teen pregnancy rates. Um, that's absolutely true. Yeah. Here we are, we don't educate, and when things like nine year olds sending pictures happens, we go to the law. And then we criminalize it. <laughs> and so now that we're criminalizing these kids, had this not been given the opportunity right. to find out what should have done, I mean, these kids might be walking around as a, a, as a sexual predators for the rest of their lives at nine years old. Absolutely. Uh, because that's how law works, that's how criminalizing this works. Right. So the, the education system fails, <laughs> the law system fails, and nobody's. And there we are. Works. And I think one of the things that you'll see is in the, the last five or ten years, um, the threshold for what constitutes violence and what constitutes aggression, the threshold has dropped. And so that, make, that makes it um, possible for law enforcement to walk in and arrest a nine-year-old. Um, Steve Newton did a, um, a video on recidivism in the state of Tennessee in terms of incarceration. and. Um, and um, he, one of the people that he interviews talks about talks about the role of law enforcement and the role of legislation in um, um, in criminalizing aggression and what that what that means for children and what that means for adult populations in the state of Tennessee moving forward in the future. That's really interesting. So that Political means. science majors need to be advocating for yeah <laughs> for non -absence. We've got a strange legislature in this state. I mean, it's not like it's not like these guys, and I'm talking guys, predominantly, yeah, are going to be proactive for this kind of change in the school systems. Yeah. And people are just real scared about their kids talking about sex. Well, they're talking about it anyway. Oh, yeah, absolutely. When I when I talk to, sometimes I, usually the Ask the Sex for presentations I do, I start by asking where people learned about sex for the first time. And it's just really fascinating to hear people talk about where, where it is, and it's almost never in their sex education. And when it is, when someone has had that kind of unique experience, everyone's like, wow, it's so unique. Um, you know, because for the most part, it's like their older brother telling them wrong information about where things go, or like hearing in the locker room or porn. The day, yeah. The other day at the I Heart Female Orgasm when we were broken off into the, the whole male thing, half the room said they learned it from porn. The other half said they learned it from church. So figure that out. Like, <laughs> somewhere between here. Two gonna, very, uh, two very different. So. And then and then if, if, you, if you've learned that from both places, then you're like, which one is right? I'm so confused. <laughs> Real complicated. All right, well, thank you all so much for coming. I appreciate it. And thank you again for Phyllis for having me. Thanks.